Hello everybody and welcome to the Dry Dock episode 275. This week the questions are taken from guide 340 and 341 on the Russian brew dreadnoughts Sisoy Veliki and Poltava, it's slightly more easy to pronounce Russian ships, thank you very much Russia, and the Wednesday videos on Russian and Soviet battleships with Steve McLaughlin, and the 2022 US tour video on USS Alabama and a guest question from the Friday video about learning about the age of sail the book recommendations so let's begin Paul Peterson asks in numerous recent guides covering pre-dreadnoughts Sisoy Veliki included it seems that rather frequently ships came in sufficiently overweight that their armor belt was fully underwater were there ships that came in underweight Obviously, this is an easy fix by just adding ballast, fuel, or spare parts. However, given that fact, why wouldn't naval engineers of the day give themselves more margin for error on the total tonnage? There's two main factors involved in, as you mentioned, quite a lot of vessels coming in significantly overweight. And that can essentially be summed up as technology and politics. The latter is perhaps a little bit more understandable. When somebody comes along and says, okay, we want to build a ship and it's going to have this capability and therefore it's going to weigh this much and it's therefore going to cost this much money. One of the first things most treasury departments do, because most treasury departments tend to be staffed by clones of Gollum who treat every bit of currency as if it's the one ring itself, is to try and cut that down. Of course, the Treasury officials have no idea about actual defence policy or what ships actually need to function. All they can see is numbers. And so if you turn around and say, well, I want to build, let's say, a 12,000 ton battleship and you persuade them to give you the money for it. And partway through its fitting out, it turns out the battleship only weighs 11,000 tons. You'll very quickly get a bunch of Treasury officials knocking on your door saying, can we have a bunch of our money back or else? Because obviously, if it's only 11,000 tons, it therefore couldn't possibly have cost as much as the 12,000 ton ship that you originally asked for. And so there is a reasonable amount of pressure on designers to actually, you know, hit the weight limit or close to it as quick much as you possibly can. And... Different nations have different margins built into that. So in the Royal Navy, it'll be called the Admiralty Margin. Other navies will call it other things. But essentially, it, that is an acknowledgement that there may well be a little bit of feature creep. And so if you're building your hypothetical 12,000 ton battleship, you'll actually build it at, let's say, for example, 11,600 tons and hope that the inevitable creep and maybe you know additional things that come in a little bit overweight will use up that 400 tons so you'll actually come in spot on you don't give yourself a thousand ton margin because as i say you'll end up with either the treasury demanding money back or you'll end up with a ship that if it actually does launch a thousand tons underweight is going to have some serious stability issues and whilst, yes, you can add things to it to weigh it down, those additional things cost money and see aforementioned issues with the Treasury. The other problem specifically for a lot of pre-dreadnoughts, especially those built in the 1890s, and to a certain extent this kind of repeats itself with some of the early dreadnoughts, is the sheer speed of technological advancement, which means that you can start designing a ship, and in the time between you first putting pen to paper and that ship entering the fleet, so much will have changed that people will have insisted, sometimes rightly, sometimes wrongly, on adding additional features to the ship, or changing wholesale parts of the design. And so you might have finalised your design, again using a hypothetical 12,000 tonner, at 11,600 tonnes with a 400 tonne margin, but if somebody's come in and insisted, well, actually, we need to uh, change out the 
secondary battery for a new type of gun. And we're also going to add some more guns as a result, uh, possibly to the secondary battery, possibly to other batteries. Also, there's this new radio stuff we're going to put on. And perhaps also if you go a little bit uh, further past the 1890s, there's also this new rangefinder and fire control tech, uh, maybe some torpedo launchers, etc., etc., etc. You can suddenly find your beautiful 11,600 tonner hitting the water and can then being fitted out at close to 13,000 tons, at which point your armor belt is pretty much uh, a submersible object. And to be entirely fair, the pace of technological advancement means, as I said, some of these changes can be actually perfectly reasonable. For example, when the designers first sat down to sketch out Sisoy Veliki, compound armor was still, to a certain extent, the current thing in vogue. In the time between first pen to paper and Sisoy Veliki entering the fleet, it had gone from compound armor to nickel steel armor to Harvey armor, and she commissioned around about the time that crop armour was just beginning to be marketed. So there's a huge range of armour technologies in there that could at any point have had someone turn around and say, actually, we want to completely redo the armour protection with this new material. And that can be more difficult or easier depending on which particular part of the ship you're re-armouring. Likewise, quick-firing gun technology quick-firing guns of a calibre large enough to form the secondary battery of a pre-dreadnought were only just about being introduced at the time that Sisoy Veliki was laid down. But guns, or at least the smaller ones, are relatively easy to reorder and reinstall, especially if you're just going, okay, well, this is a normal six-inch gun and we're going to put a quick-firing six-inch gun or whatever in instead. And so obviously that will have implications on weight, etc., etc. And by the time she commissions, quick-firing six-inch guns, again using that example, are very, very common. McEvely asks, You said Sisoy Veliki had nickel steel plating. How would the process of re-armouring the ship to a new type of plating take place? Is it a simple case of just getting the ship into dry dock, removing the current plating, and installing the new armour, or would the ship itself have to be entirely redesigned and a new class built with the upgraded armour? In theory, it can be relatively easy to re-armour the belt of a battleship with newer and better armour, providing you've checked two major things. Firstly, how is it fixed to the hull of the ship? And secondly, is the armour a structural member? So the, for the first one, if the armour, I mean the armour is going to be bolted onto the side, but if the armour is bolted to the ship in such a way as you could, relatively speaking, easily unbolt it, then obviously it's going to be much easier to remove. Whereas if somebody's done something particularly inventive, like uh, using rivets, or uh, perhaps they've forged the bolts in, then that's going to be a lot more difficult because there's a lot more work involved to get the thing loose. And the second part, of course, is said the structural part, i.e. can the ship stand up in a dry dock or wherever if it doesn't have that armour present or is that armour part a significant structural element, i.e. it supports part of the ship's load? That's somewhat rarer but occasionally it does happen. And if that is the case, then you aren't going to be able to replace it very easily because if you take all the armor off, uh, the ship will probably break in two. But assuming that it's not a structural element and assuming that you can unbolt it relatively easily, then taking the ship into a dry dock or potentially even just up to a quayside and removing the armor plate and slotting your armor plate in you know, the ship is fitted out with its armour plate usually after launching anyway. It's not a particularly difficult job in and of itself. And you should still have the drawings that show the exact forms of each of the armour plates, because, of course, they're not all just rectangular flat slabs. But the larger problem is, one, it's going to cost a lot of money because all the money you invested in the previous armour plate is essentially useless, uh, wasted, and you're going to have to pay for a whole bunch of new armour plate to be manufactured as well, plus the dock time, etc. 
But more to the point, if the ship's designers have done their jobs properly, then the armor the ship was launched with should meet the design requirements for the ship. It should resist incoming shell fire of the ships that it's expected to meet in combat. If you are going to replace that with new armor, so let's say you're replacing compound armor or nickel steel with Harvey or Krupp, then you're going to face a rather interesting problem outside of the cost issue, which is that either the level of protection was sufficient, and if it wasn't, then why wasn't it? But assuming that it was sufficient, you could either replace the armor with its equivalent in the newer steel, which would save a lot of weight, but could potentially lead to stability issues, because now you've got a lot less weight low down and therefore proportionally more weight higher up, or you could replace it with a similar thickness of armor in the new material, which will make the ship substantially more protected, but may enter the realm of absurdly too well protected, i.e. why should someone pay for a 12-inch thickness of brand new, let's say, crop armor to protect the ship in 1898 when nobody has guns uh, arbitrarily speaking, that can penetrate nine inches of crop armor. So why are we paying for that extra three inches? And bearing in mind, given it's a new technology, there will be a premium price attached to that. So it's one of those cases of, theoretically, it can actually be done surprisingly easily, but practically speaking, there's an awfully long list of reasons why it virtually never was done. Prussian Hill asks... In your opinion, Drac, what would need to be changed, either on the Japanese side or the Russian side, for the Russians to win the Russo-Japanese War? And would the Russians in particular have been able to improve the outcome for themselves without the advantage of future knowledge? So there's obviously the easy ones about training and equipment and so on and so forth, but there are I would say two large scale strategic changes that could have been made pre-war, one on the Russian side, one on the Japanese side, which might have massively influenced the outcome of the Battle of Tsushima. And obviously, you know, I'm not going to get involved in the land side of the conflict because I'm not a land based military historian. I don't really know huge amounts about that. So this is looking at it purely from the naval side, from the perspective of if the Russians have control of the sea around the area of the Russo-Japanese War, they can prevent the Japanese from supplying and reinforcing their troops, which in theory should eventually cause the Japanese offensive to break down and wither. Whereas, obviously, if the Japanese do control the seas, which they historically ended up doing, then they can supply and redeploy and reinforce their men, which obviously gives them a bit of a leg up. So purely operating on that basis, i.e., you know, what could sw swing Tsushima or potentially some of the earlier battles over to the Russian side, from the Russian side, it would be a much greater shift of strategic perspective. So at the time, the Russians had their Baltic fleet and their Black Sea fleet facing off against whoever they were not very happy with in mainland Europe, up in the Baltic, and primarily the Ottomans down in the Black Sea. And the Black Sea was, to a certain degree, seen as a very prestigious uh, fleet to be in. And then you had the Pacific Squadron, which was being built up because Russia was now expanding its territorial ambitions over to the Pacific. Now, although it might have been at least politically a bit of a roll of the dice, the Russians could have sat back and gone, OK, realistically, if the British come after us, the Baltic fleet isn't going to stop them. But who else in Europe do we potentially have issues with? We are allied with France, or at least we've got an understanding with them. The Germans are building up their fleet rather dramatically. But again, we have France and the Marine Nationale theoretically on side. And the Germans are probably not going to want to try and pour their fleet into the Baltic when they have France and potentially Britain looking over their shoulder. So we can maybe redirect some of the ships from the Baltic fleet over to the Pacific Squadron. 
And in a similar vein, look at the Black Sea. Who's our main dash only opponent there? Well, the Ottomans. And look at the recent, at that period, uh, Greco-Ottoman War. And you realise that, realistically, the Ottoman Navy really isn't up to all that much anymore. At which point you could also potentially strip out a reasonable number of ships from the Baltic fleet and send them over to the Pacific Squadron. Essentially leave the, uh, sorry, the Black Sea Fleet. I leave the Black Sea Fleet as a force that's capable of dealing with whatever rust buckets the Ottoman Navy happens to have available, and again, direct everything else to the Pacific Squadron. That overall massively beefs up the Pacific Squadron, which, combined with a little bit more training and funding and development of its anchorages, might leave the Pacific Fleet, I guess at that point, Russian Pacific Fleet, capable of dealing with the Imperial Japanese Navy on a sort of toe-to-toe battle basis, which, you know, that might potentially win them the war, because if they beat the Japanese and get sea dominance, see what I said previously. The other thing could be that, obviously, this goes a little further back, but when the uh, Japanese felt fought the Chinese at the end of the 19th century, they were operating primarily under a Jeune Ecole style fleet. And although they did beat the Chinese fleet, it was a much closer run thing than it should have been, given the numbers and modernity of the ships involved on both sides. That experience prompted the Japanese to switch to a more British-style battleship-centric battle fleet, which is the fleet that they largely fought uh, the Russo-Japanese war with, if for whatever reason the maybe the Battle of Yalu River goes better or the Japanese just decide maybe they just did something wrong and the Japanese stick with a primarily Jeune Ecole based fleet, then as well, as you saw historically with that exact war and with a few other wars that were fought, even with the training and material deficiencies in the Russian fleet, Fighting something like the Battle of the Yellow Sea or the Battle of Tsushima, where the Russian fleet actually has capital ships and the Japanese have at best some armoured cruisers and mostly smaller ships than that, that might in and of itself be enough to win the bat- those battles for the Russians regardless of anything else. Brendan Boersdorf asks, While doing a bit of research on the British K-class subs, I came across the German Project 50 submarines. They look far more capable than the K-Class, but of course, looks can be deceiving. Is there any information we can use to compare the two classes and see which was better in the execution of the steam-powered submarine concept? Well, we'll never know exactly how well the Project 50s would have worked, because of course none of them were built. Uh, depending on your source, one was either laid down at the by the end of World War One, but never completed, or potentially it was ordered and materials assembled, but not actually physically laid down on a slipway. Either way, they weren't built. By the way, shout out to The Dreadnought Project. Absolutely fantastic website if you haven't found it already. Um, They are the original hosts of this incredibly detailed plan of the Project 50. Um, Unless you're viewing this on HD, it probably doesn't do it justice. And to be honest, even if you are watching this in HD, there's a lot more detail on this plan than you can probably see. Trust me, it's a really good website maintained by a couple of absolutely brilliant historians. Really should go and have a look at it. Anyway, back to Project 50. You can look at the basic concepts of the K-Class and the Project 50s and their stats and draw some comparisons. But one of the first things that's rather obvious is that the Project 50s, which are u are massively bigger than the K-Class, if you can believe it. Uh, In terms of their submerged displacement, they're about 60% greater displacement than the K-Class, and, you know, commensurately longer and slightly wider. Which does make any direct comparison a little bit unfair because of the monstrous size differences, but nonetheless... One of the weaknesses the Project 50s would have shared with the K-Class would have been a relatively shallow operating depth, uh, partly due to their size and partly due to a feature which we'll discuss a little bit later. Now, surface speed-wise, 
the Project 50s were supposed to be a little bit faster than the Ks, uh, capable of, uh, in theory, 25 knots on the surface, but they don't appear to have had retractable funnels the way that the K-class would, so their underwater hydrodynamics would be considerably worse. Likewise, the Project 50s are much more heavily armed. There's no less than four, roughly six inch, so 5.9 inch, considering it's German, guns up there at on the deck, uh, two at the front and two at the back. So gun-wise, considering that the K-class had a pair of four inches, the Project 50s are much more heavily armed than that. There's also, in terms of torpedo armament, they they are carrying larger torpedoes than the Ks. The Ks are carrying 18-inch tubes. The Project 50s appear to be carrying a much larger 21-inch tube. And being a larger sub, there are considerably more of them and considerably more torpedoes carried although they are carried in a rather bizarre fashion. So <laughs> you have rear firing tubes. Okay, that's fair enough. That's pretty common for a large sub at least. But the way they're set up is you've got two incredibly difficult to reload tubes pointing directly aft. Then you've got two tubes splayed out at about 30 degrees. Uh, so obviously firing at an off angle so you've got four total aft up front if you look at the diagram carefully it looks like you've got four tubes up front with reloads obviously but when you look more closely the upper set are actually labeled torpedo lager Ruhr, which if my high school german is functioning it means torpedo storage tube as opposed to the lower um, tubes which are very definitely firing tubes so it only has two forward firing tubes and using a little bit of space above for storage but it also has a possibly unique feature on a submarine in that it has an internal set of muzzle loading torpedo tubes which are on a swivel mount and they're positioned just underneath the second of the four guns in front of the conning tower so the chamber they're in is watertight and you would load the torpedoes from further forward in the sub into these things and then they rotate 45 degrees to port or starboard where in theory they then mate up with a pair of hatches in either side of the sub so that they can fire a pair of torpedoes at a 45 degree angle it's a really interesting take on the broadside firing torpedo situation personally i have severe reservations as to whether or not you'd get a waterproof seal properly on that at any significant depth although given the fact this thing probably wouldn't go to particularly deep depths and it may have you may be using this particular launcher above water it may not be quite this issue it might otherwise appear to be so a very heavy torpedo armament but one with potentially some questions about its real viability and usability with the exception of those forward tubes um and what in what appears to be an attempt to avoid although obviously they didn't know about the k-class at the time but to avoid a similar thing to what happened to a few k-class with their boiler rooms getting swamped they appear to have isolated the four boilers in independently contained capsules that actually extend past the pressure hull so they've kind of built four blisters they're almost an outer hull section they obviously then feed back into the turbine room but in theory then if one or more of those boiler rooms is flooded you won't theoretically lose all of them but obviously that's a compromise in the pressure hull which as i say was probably going to restrict its overall diving depth and realistically if the funnel is overwhelmed by water you're probably going to get water pouring down into all four so i would say that the subdivision whilst a good idea on paper probably would have been relatively ineffective in practice so unsurprisingly for such a large vessel compared to even the k-class the project 50s overall are probably somewhat better vessels 
with three main exceptions, one obviously being its underwater performance is going to be somewhat compromised by that big funnel that they can't retract compared to the K-Class. Its sheer size means it's probably going to be hideously unmaneuverable even compared to a K-Class. And I rather suspect that without some rather inventive bits of technology, given the time period they're supposed to be built in, their dive and ascent times would have been, again, even worse than a K-Class. So, you know, big and clumsy and not particularly good underwater, but otherwise, on paper, their stats are much better than the Ks. Dejang Abrovsek asks, How effective and useful were searchlights in World War I? and World War II, and how often were they used? They could be very, very effective, and they were used in almost all night actions up until you know the very end of World War II, with the exception of a few that were torpedo-only engagements, or were very heavily reliant on late World War II radar, or in situations where there was really, really strong moonlight. However, they could work for or against you, Broadly speaking, despite their name being Search Light, they don't seem to have done the ships that bore them any favours when used as Search Lights. Primarily because if you are unsure of where an enemy ship is, or perhaps you know that there is a ship out there and you're unsure of its identity, shining a Search Light on them, if they're not expecting a friendly ship, or they know there's not a friendly ship in your direction, basically tells them, hey, that big source of light there is an enemy and they're marking their position very nicely, especially if you've missed the target ship in question when you're looking for it. So how about we shoot at them and the ship in question becomes a giant fire magnet. And that happened to a certain degree in World War One, a couple of instances, the Battle of Jutland, for example, and certainly happened multiple times in World War II with various ships who switched on their searchlights to find out what was going on, very rapidly finding out that what was going on was they were being shot at an awful lot. Conversely, if you have identified an enemy ship, i.e. you're pretty sure the ship that you can see to some degree is hostile, and then you illuminate it with the searchlights either to mark it for other ships that haven't switched on their searchlights or simultaneous with an opening of a fire by your own vessel or to blind the enemy if by you know shining at their bridge or their searchlight operator so they can't find or see you or more often a combination of all three then they tend to be very effective because they tend to surprise and slow down your enemy's response and obviously give you much better information for your rangefinders, which all culminates in you being able to shoot them to pieces very, very quickly. So, for example, the Battle of Matapan, good example of a use of searchlights in that sort of manner. And outside of direct ship versus ship combat, during night actions against aircraft, usually, if you're at sea, you probably wouldn't want to use your searchlights for the same reasons you wouldn't want to use your searchlights to look for the enemy if they were enemy ships, simply because putting those searchlights on gives enemy bombers a very, very easy point to aim at. However, if you're already under attack by bombers, let's say, again, uh, moonlit night, and they've spotted you, but you can't necessarily entirely spot them, then searchlights might give your anti-aircraft gunners something to look for. Um, or again, maybe if you're really lucky, might dazzle the pilots. But more prosaically, ships don't spend all of their time at sea, and as we found with Admiral Cunningham in the recent instalment of his life story, the ships when they're in harbour and there are bomber attacks coming in whether aimed at them or aimed at the harbour in general can use their searchlights to help direct their anti-aircraft gun crews because warships tend to have very heavily concentrated clusters of anti-aircraft guns relative to an entire city and that allows them to help out quite considerably in the air defence plus there is a small percentage of deception available there in that if the bomber crews are going in expecting to look for ships and expecting the land-based searchlight batteries to light them up, there is a outside chance that by having your ship use its searchlights, the bombers might think 
and I stress might, think that you are another anti-aircraft battery, i.e. a land-based one, and look for you elsewhere. Vaxmillion asks, I had some questions about dreadnoughts, mostly in terms of terminology and classification. What makes a warship qualify as a dreadnought? As in, what set of traits makes one look at a ship and say, yes, this is in fact a dreadnought? Is it all big guns, all or nothing armor scheme, machinery capability and top speed, super firing turrets, all of the above, none of the above, or something else? Also, can armored cruisers be considered pre-dreadnought battleships? On the armored cruiser question, no, they are very specifically different roles. However, I will grant you that it can get very murky at the upper end of armoured cruisers and the lower end of battleships. So if you take some of the extremes of pre-dreadnought battleships, at least the ones intended to be first-class units, you can find something like the Canopus class with six inches of crap armour, and you can look at a couple of German pre-dreadnoughts, the Wittelsbachs and the preceding, I think it's the Kaiser Friedrich the Thirds, and they only have 9.4 inch guns as their main armament. Now you, you can then compare that to some armoured cruisers which have more and heavier guns like the Ten Tennessees and Pennsylvanias with four 10 inch guns, technically speaking outgunning the German pre-dreadnought battleships even though the Tennessees and Pennsylvanias are armoured cruisers. And whilst it's a little bit difficult, you can find the occasional armoured cruiser which has slightly more armour than a Canopus-class battleship, although you can also find quite a lot of armoured cruisers that have 6-inch belt armour like a Canopus-class battleship. However, whilst there is this, as I say, this overlap, broadly speaking, the vast, 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 vast majority of armoured cruisers will have lesser firepower, higher speed, and lesser armour. The the mo most pre-dreadnoughts will be significantly better protected than the vast majority of armoured cruisers, but they will be slower in exchange for it, as well as carrying heavier guns. So your, your average pre-dreadnought with 11 or 12-inch guns uh, is going to outgun armoured cruisers of any flavour. And even with those aforementioned outliers, whilst the Canopus is only about as protected as some of the better armoured cruisers, she does have a massive firepower advantage. And with the Wittelsbachs and their predecessors, although they might be outgunned by some armoured cruisers, they do have significantly more protection. Now, to make a warship a dreadnought, that's an interesting one. There are various conceptions going around, some of them which can be knocked off relatively quickly. It's not all or nothing armour, because you know nothing prior to the Nevada had all or nothing armour, and there's an awful lot of dreadnoughts that were built prior to the Nevada, and a considerable number that were built after her without all or nothing armour as well. So it's not that. Machinery capability and top speed, it is an interesting one, because of course dreadnought, the first dreadnought, introduces turbines and as a result is capable of making 21 knots which is considerably faster than almost any pre-dreadnought previously and the one or two that come close in terms of speed have sacrificed quite considerably in other aspects like protection and firepower to get there but equally you do have ships like the Nassau's and Helgoland's and the South Carolinas and a few others which are built using the more traditional triple expansion engines and most of the time are counted as dreadnoughts. Although interestingly enough, whilst the South Carolinas have a more advanced firepower layout than dreadnought does, because they use uh, four twin turrets in super firing positions to get the same eight gun broadside, whereas dreadnought uses 10 turrets without super firing. So, Theoretically, in some respects, South Carolina is slightly more advanced than Dreadnought, but in large part because of her propulsion plant, the US Navy themselves had pretty much delisted the South Carolinas from their Dreadnought order of battle, even by the middle of World War I, and the South Carolinas were sort of awkwardly lumped off as being more like upgraded pre-Dreadnoughts than early Dreadnoughts in the US Navy's operational mindset at least. But 
they are technically speaking and you know, for most practical purposes as well, still dreadnoughts because the main element of what makes dreadnought dreadnought and what makes all other dreadnoughts dreadnought is the all big gun main armament. That at its core is the main criteria. So uh, a ship that possesses a main battery in a battleship gun caliber possesses at least six as an absolute minimum but more preferentially eight or more guns in that caliber and in that length. So that's why, for example, the brown schvigs don't count because their fifth and sixth guns are a 35 caliber weapon as opposed to a 40 caliber weapon on the other four. And that armament is intended to be the primary way of engaging enemy capital ships. So, you know, it might have a secondary battery of some description for dealing with and, uh, torpedo boats and destroyers, but that secondary battery cannot have a primary role of engaging enemy capital ships the way that the secondary batteries on pre-dreadnoughts did. So the type, number, and usage of the big main battery guns is pretty much at its core what defines whether a ship is a dreadnought or a pre-dreadnought. Jonathan White asks, given that by the time 4 said showed up, Singapore was a lost cause, wouldn't it have been best to head for Diego Garcia or join the remnants of the US Asiatic fleet in Australia, where they would have been able to put up stiffer resistance until the counteroffensive of the Solomons campaign? I think I disagree with the assessment that Singapore was a lost cause, given that 4 said showed up pretty much in early December 1941 when Japan enters the war, and Singapore doesn't fall until February 1942, some months later. Now, granted, there's a long list of reasons why Singapore did fall, but equally, the Japanese were really pushing it to actually capture Singapore. The more and more you read about the fall of Singapore, the more and more you realise that if Singapore hadn't have surrendered when it did, there's a reasonable chance that either a allied counter-offensive or just sitting there and waiting it out might have caused the Japanese to withdraw. Um, it's a bit 50-50 because, of course, the Allies were also a little bit short on supplies, quite considerably in some aspects. And essentially it was a case of who blinked first, and in this case the Allies were the ones who blinked first. And I say allies because although Singapore's a British fortress, it wasn't just the British fighting to hold it. There were Australians, there were representatives of various nations all there. So with only a few slight variations, it's entirely possible that Singapore, if not necessarily holding out for the entirety of the war, at least would repulse that initial Japanese assault and last for quite a while longer. Uh, so for example, if Prince of Wales had, instead of speeding to get to Singapore, had maybe escorted a small to medium-sized convoy that was bringing in a bunch of supplies and ammunition, etc., for the base, then that might have provided them with enough ammunition to hold out. If the defensive layout of the men that were at Singapore had been done slightly better, that might have also helped. Um... If the counteroffensive had been launched with the benefit of having better prepared defences and additional supplies brought in by Prince of Wales, that would have helped. And if Forsyth themselves had survived, you know, a battle cruiser and a battleship firing with all batteries over essentially open sights into the Japanese advance would have done some serious damage to them. Although, of course, they would have had to contend with rather continued Japanese air attacks. So there are a number of relatively easily changeable things that could have resulted, as I said, not necessarily in Singapore holding out for the rest whole of the war, but at least in it holding out for the short term in the early part of 1942. With that said, um, you've also got to consider the fact that when Forsyth sailed, if it wasn't for slightly duff intelligence, not just in terms of where the Japanese aircraft could go, but also where the Japanese landing ships were so if if intel had been slightly better in directing force said to their targets and the one japanese submarine hadn't spotted them on their way back then force said might not only have survived but also done serious damage to the japanese invasion effort by sinking part of the invasion fleet 
which in and of itself, even without all the other stuff we mentioned, might have allowed Singapore to survive. But on a completely separate basis, if Force Z had shown up and let's say everything goes as it did historically, except for the Japanese submarine doesn't spot Force Z, so the Japanese aircraft circle and circle can't find them and go home, so Force Z survives that day, then yes, at that point, if nothing else has changed with regards to Singapore, i.e. they haven't come with reinforcements or resupply ships, then it probably would have been better once it became clear that the Japanese were going to invest Singapore for for said to have departed to Australia to join up with the what would eventually become the remnants of ABDA command, although Forset probably would have been lumped into ABDA command at some point, which probably wouldn't have gone terrifically well. But that if if they had managed to get to Australia, they probably would have then been able to form a backbone for Allied efforts at resistance in the early part of 1942 in that area. Although it also has to be remembered, of course, that the Japanese got to where they got in uh, the Siege of Singapore by some truly appallingly brutal methods. I mean, uh, the Wikipedia article on the fall of Singapore, which again, you know, always check the sources that are cited in the Wikipedia article rather than just believing it wholesale. And I pick on, oh well, this particular article for this exact reason of showing the fact that it doesn't actually tell you the full story. If you look at the Wikipedia article on the fall of Singapore, it says, oh, the Japanese, um, yeah, they repaired the roads that the Allies had damaged to enable them to continue the advance. Now, that sounds fairly normal, you know, dirt and stones, maybe some bulldozers, that kind of thing. That's not the case. We have eyewitness accounts from Japanese soldiers who were present who will testify to the fact that the way the Japanese filled in those roads, because precisely they couldn't bring up the engineering materials they needed to fill the roads quickly enough, was to march Allied prisoners of war up to those shell holes, shoot them, and use the bodies as infill with a minimal packing of dirt on top. It didn't have to be pretty, but it just had to work long enough for their advance to work. And yeah, you're not going to find that detail on Wikipedia unless someone goes in and edits it now. Um, but that's the ruthlessness with which the Japanese were driving forward, which, uh, shockingly enough, using prisoners as road fill was not on the list of anticipated ways of fixing shell damage that the Allies had, and that kind of thing, to a certain degree, allowed the Japanese to act in a more militarily effective manner, if a morally reprehensible manner, compared to what you know pre prior plans for resistance would otherwise have indicated. And then we have, are you aware of any plans to use the excellent FW-190 on the Graf Zeppelin as a fighter? I know it could have been used effectively in both fighter bomber and even torpedo bomber configurations. And aside from its range maybe being a bit short, I don't see any reason that it couldn't have been used, but I've not come across much information on what they were actually planning to use. There weren't any plans to use the FW-190 on the Graf Zeppelin for the very good reason that the FW-190 didn't exist when the Graf Zeppelin was ordered. Uh, the BF-109 did, and so it was the BF-109-ME-109, which was the aircraft that was selected for use as the fighter for the Graf Zeppelin. By the time the FW-190 actually saw service and you know, it made its early flights, that's at the point where Graf Zeppelin has already been launched but is stalled out awaiting a completion that would never come. Theoretically, the renewed interest in completing Graf Zeppelin in 1942 could have seen the FW-190 selected as the new naval fighter. I mean, it's going to have somewhat better visibility than the 109. It's going to have a slightly less collapsible undercarriage than the 109. And it also has a slightly shorter takeoff distance, which means that you might not, if you make some adaptations to it, then depending on the make and model, you might not actually need the catapults to get the 109 to take off the of Graf Zeppelin's flight deck. Uh, for reference, the takeoff distance that's required for a piston engine World War II aircraft generally is reduced by to about 55% of standard if the carrier is heading into a 25 to 30 knot wind, which of course most carriers can do even if the air is still just by motoring forwards. And in that respect, 
the BF109, even with that advantage, you can't quite take off from Graf Zeppelin's flight deck unless you have one maybe right at the very back. Whereas the FW190, without further modifications, perhaps to increase lift, would be able to take off from maybe just over two thirds of the way down the Graf Zeppelin's flight deck. So launch wise, and to a certain extent landing wise, the FW190 would have made a better fighter for Graf Zeppelin. Some people have criticized the, F the potential choice of the FW190 in the past by saying it had too high a landing speed. Now, whilst yes, technically it did have a higher landing speed than a BF109, the landing speed for the FW190 was actually similar to the landing speed of an F4U Corsair. The F6F Hellcat, which it's usually, which you know, naval flights usually compared to, had a remarkably low landing speed. In fact, it had a lower landing speed even than the F4F Wildcat. So, whilst technically correct in that it would have come in a little bit faster than a BF109, with the size of Graf Zeppelin's flight deck and comparable, you know, decent carrier-based fighters having a similar landing speed, there's nothing that would have stopped the FW190 in that respect, from being a relatively decent carrier fighter. However, as I said, by the time the FW190 is even in service and therefore potentially selectable, a Graf Zeppelin is actually past the point at which she's ever going to be completed. Vinve asks, when did sync exercises first take place and how scientific were these first exercises? I don't know if this counts as the first sync exercise in modern times. Uh, it's a little difficult to find that kind of information. If anyone does know, then obviously let us know in the comments below if they can find a specific sync or basically wrecking exercise done for training or testing purposes that's before this. But in 1824, a French ship of the line, which is actually a sister ship of Boucentar, was used as an experimental target for the new Pehan shell guns that had just been invented. And rather predictably, the shell guns absolutely pulverized the poor ship, thus proving the efficacy of shell guns in ship versus ship combat if you were fighting in a traditional age of sail wooden walls line of battle. So, you know, that would be my initial candidate for a Syncex, if you like, or Syncex like thing. Um, and there were similar tests going forward in time. Martin Schull was tested on an old Royal Navy Hulk in the 1850s to see exactly what its incendiary effect would be. But I suspect if you go further back, you're going to find that there aren't really m many, if any, sync exercises, because prior to that, at least, you know, in the age of sail, if you go back to medieval times and further, I think it's probably reaching quite a bit. But in the age of sail, it was already known that if you shot a ship full of enough cannonballs, it would sink. You didn't need a test to prove that. And outside of the invention of the carronade, there wasn't really a massive amount of advancement in the age of sail as far as guns went. Obviously, guns became more common, more regular, etc. But the actual physical smashing power of them, if anything, went down slightly in favour of rate of fire, as opposed to some of the really monstrous stuff you see in the early part of the age of sail. As for how scientific they were, the early to mid 19th century tests were actually, relatively speaking, usually quite scientific in that they would fire on a ship for a bit and then they would stop and either go aboard to put fires out or just generally inspect what damage had been done and then recommence. So they were interested in not just can X weapon destroy X target, but how X weapon destroyed X target. Gregory Albert asks, how would a first rate built with modern day materials fare in the ironclad era? It would be made out of more modern materials like steel and aluminium and should theoretically be able to mount more powerful guns than even the largest or strongest first rates historically could. Well, yes, if you're going to build something that looks like a first rate out of steel and aluminium and other modern materials, you're not really building a first rate, you're building a modern steel ship that happens to look vaguely like a first rate. But nonetheless, if you did do so, a lot of it is going to come down to exactly how much armour you fit on the thing. 
because obviously the sides of first rate ships of the line were incredibly thick. Now, you're not going to be able to replicate that thickness in metal unless you're doing something silly like using foamed aluminium because you'd make a ship so heavy that it would just sink the minute you put it in the water. However, if you use one of the equivalent conversion tables and actually one of the few that goes all the way from iron down to crop and for emphasis, there are different ones that will give slightly different figures, but uh, this particular set of calculations I'm using is one of the few that, as I said, runs all the way through consistently, as opposed to picking, you know, a conversion from compound armor to iron armor, and then picking a separate one that's Harvey from compound, and so on and so forth. Anyway, Warrior's 4.5 inch uh, iron armor is theoretically equivalent to 1.4 inches of late era Krupp style cemented armor, face hardened armor. Now, 1.4 inches, that's basically slightly thick hole plating. Now, of course, that runs into the complication that you can't really make face hardened armor 1.4 inches thick, which, you know, like you might need a little bit more than that. But if, say, you took that up to three inches, so now we are moving definitely into armor plate territory, although it's still somewhat questionable whether you can get face hardened three inch thick armor, that would give you protection equivalent to 10 inches of iron, which is, you know, equivalent to a late 1860s, early 1870s ironclad. So it would basically depend on a how much armor you want to use instead of very thick ship sides on your metal ship of the line and then how much you can actually put on thickness wise before the relatively small size of the ship makes it too dense to float. Miko Lightman asks, could Wallace's bouncing bombs have been theoretically used against the San Nazaire dock gates? After all they can blast through dams made of solid concrete so getting through a dock gate should be pretty easy. Theoretically, yes, the bouncing bombs would have made a complete mess of the San Nazaire docks. There's enough of a, an open water stretch on the approach to it that a Lancaster could fly straight and level to line up its shot. And as you said, the dock gates are far more fragile. However, there is a couple of practical restrictions on the mission and one rather large elephant in the room. The practical restrictions are that although the dock gates at San Nazaire are quite wide, for dry dock gates, they're nowhere near the size of a dam, so they would be a fairly small target to try and hit with a bouncing bomb, but it could be done, I suppose. The other problem is, of course, that occupied San Nazaire has quite a hefty number of anti-aircraft guns, as well as the ability, depending on the time of day dash night, to call on Luftwaffe fighter support. So any attack run made by Lancasters, bearing in mind they would have to loop out, probably at sea, around and approach San Nazaire from the south, hopefully, well, I think one would have to presume with Pathfinder bombers, probably mosquitoes or something, to drop flares so that they could actually see where the the dry dock is. Because again, it's although large, it's somewhat smaller and in the middle of a very densely built up urban environment, so somewhat harder to spot than a big dam that's just surrounded by hills. So yeah, Lancaster casualties would probably be fairly high, but those are the practical issues it could in theory be done and it would in theory be fairly effective. The big elephant in the room is that the first successful tests of the bouncing bomb didn't take place until the end of 1942. The San Nazaire raid took place in March 1942 and Operation Chastise, the breaching of the German dams, that didn't take place until May 1943. So the big problem is timing. The bouncing bomb simply doesn't exist at the time period when the Royal Navy believes it needs to get rid of the ability for the Germans to use the sand as their docks. If it did exist, let's say Barnes Wallace manages to persuade everyone to let him build it a year and a half earlier, then sure, they probably would have given that a shot. Or if the Germans had rebuilt the San Nazaire docks and made them fully operational and the British were still worried about turpits, they might have gone after it with bouncing bombs. 
but unfortunately, as far as the wartime scenario as we have it in history is concerned, it's just too late. Paul Pimblot asks, we know that had Japan not surrendered after the atomic bombs hit Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the US would have launched an invasion of Japan, but what were British naval plans? Would there have been an, an amphibious invasion of Malaya to liberate Singapore? And if so, how do you feel this would have gone? Well, the majority of British naval assets were tied up in supporting Operation Downfall. So that's the invasion of Japan made up of Operation Olympic and Coronet. However, the Americans seemed to be absolutely determined to try and keep everybody else out of what they perceived as their victory, particularly the British. I mean, we know the struggle that had been going on internally within the US Navy just to get the British Pacific Fleet involved, Admiral King being against it and various subordinate admirals being more for it. But when it came to planning the landings, if, believe it or not, the British and Commonwealth forces offered to supplement the American forces with their own infantry units, etc., and were outright refused and told, no, you can't have any part in it. And on, only after extensive negotiation was it agreed for a small Commonwealth element, relatively speaking, to be included in the backup forces for Coronet, which was the second invasion. So Olympic would have been purely American. The first wave of Coronet would have been purely American and only the second wave of Coronet would have had some Commonwealth element. However, the Americans' refusal for this meant that there were an awful lot of British and Commonwealth infantry forces and some naval assets available to go elsewhere. And the British concocted a pair of schemes. At first, Operation Zipper, which was to uh, at attack Malaya, and then that would be followed up by Operation Mail Fist, which would go directly for Singapore with the forces from Zipper in support. And that was planned to take place towards the end of 1945, in well, not necessarily in conjunction with, but happening at approximately the same time as some of the early elements of the invasion of Japan. Of course, as you might expect, the Americans were also opposed to that because the Americans were very opposed generally, despite being allied to the British, they were very opposed politically to the British re-establishing their imperial holdings in the Pacific. The Americans basically wanted it to turn into an American lake. But as compared to Downfall, where they were very much the leading force and in a position to largely refuse... Uh, exterior assistance if they wanted to, whilst they could be against the British efforts to go after Malaya and Singapore, there wasn't a huge amount they could do to actually stop them because there wouldn't be any American units involved that they could threaten to pull out. As far as how it would have gone, it's a little difficult to say because modif a modified version of Zipper and a completely different um, other plan to go after Singapore were engaged in the aftermath of the Japanese surrender, and bearing in mind, of course, that although the surrender order had been given, there was no guarantee that far-flung Japanese garrisons would believe it or obey it. As it turned out, they mostly did, and surrendered relatively peacefully. But from what we do know, it seems that Japanese morale, broadly speaking, was pretty low in Malaya and Singapore. There was certainly a hardcore who would have fought back, but honestly, given that they would have had almost zero air support, naval support would have been non-existent. This is for the Japanese garrison, so they would have been fighting a essentially infantry and light armour battle against an enemy that could bring to bear considerably heavier armour, a lot more artillery, a lot more infantry, as well as a full range of air and naval support. I think the Japanese probably would have folded relatively quickly because unlike somewhere like Okinawa, for instance, there's not quite as many places to bunker down and hide. And if you're in the middle of, you know, fighting for your life in a far flung distant outpost, whilst simultaneously getting the news that the Americans are swarming over your homeland, you're not going to have the world's best morale either, I think. Dave Collier asks, could you explain the engineering processes used to raise, preserve, and display 
the Mary Rose. As Dave notes in his question, this is probably also suitable for a Wednesday video, and at some point I will get round to doing a full Wednesday video, both on the career and then on the salvage of Mary Rose, uh, but I need to work a bit more closely with the Mary Rose Museum for that. But very briefly, the process of raising Mary Rose was simultaneously complex and simple. It was complex in its implementation, but the actual concept as a whole was fairly simple. It was felt that the hull probably was too fragile to survive it just being raised by you know strapping cabling to it, which was probably true. And so after all the various bits and pieces aboard the wreck, you know, cannon, longbows, remains, chests, etc., had all been taken out, the wreck could be gradually cleared. And then this massive gantry cable thing that you can see was built around it and underneath it. The idea being that obviously this would support the wreck and could then be brought up to the surface. Now, the interesting thing you might notice is that as it was brought to the surface, well, <laughs> one of the interlocking arms that held the upper section to the lower section, you can see one of those arms there on the right-hand side, failed. That's why there's nothing connecting the left-hand one that you can see here in the foreground. However, in the best traditions of engineering, they had not engineered this thing to within an inch of its life to the point that it was only capable of working exactly as intended to the minimum possible specification. They had, in fact, done the correct thing, considering you're only going to get one shot at this, and if something went wrong, it would completely destroy a priceless relic. And they'd over-engineered it. So despite one of the four major locking arms failing, all that that meant was, as you can see, that upper portion just canted slightly sideways and they were still able to bring the wreck up just on the three arms. So massive shout out to the engineers who designed that thing. You did your jobs properly and very well, I might add. Of course, once you had the ship out of the water, there was previous archaeological evidence, quite extensive archaeological evidence that showed that wood that had been down in the water, whether it be fresh or salt water for a very long time, but particularly salt water, would very rapidly decay, crumble and fall apart if you just let it dry out naturally, because essentially significant por portions of what makes up wood itself would have been leached out and replaced by salt water. And as that salt water drains away, it's no longer there. You effectively just have a kind of wood type foam arrangement, which is very, very weak and can't really support its own weight. But luckily, there was also quite strong evidence already existing on how to preserve a ship like this. So for smaller wooden finds, you could just keep them in water and gradually dry them out slowly, which is what they would do with a lot of the smaller artifacts. But for something big, well, a rather large old warship that had been sitting on the bottom of the sea for quite a while had already been salvaged, that being, of course, the Swedish Vasa. And Vasa had pioneered the use on large shipwrecks of what's called PEG, or polyethylene glycol. And that's a solution that's sprayed continuously onto the wood, and it gradually displaces the anything that isn't wood within the structure of the ship and replaces it with the inert material in the, in the polyethylene glycol. It kind of gives the ship up close, if you've ever been to see Vasa, a slightly waxy appearance. And with the techniques refined from that preservation, they took Mary Rose over to a purpose-built hall, which, to be fair, at the time looked like a giant warehouse. And they started a multi-year program that involved sitting the ship up in a cradle and spraying her with massive amounts of polyethylene glycol and then filtering out the residue that came off of it, recycling polyethylene glycol that just ran off and obviously topping it up. And this would go on for years and years and years. And that's how I first saw Mary Rose when I was four years old. She'd only, relatively speaking, recently been installed in the building. And I remember, you know, touring Victory as a four-year-old and then going to see Mary Rose. And at the time, it wasn't, to be fair, 
a hugely long lasting attraction in terms of how long you'd visit because you essentially walked on a enclosed walkway which is actually roughly where the upper walkway is in the current museum and you would just see half of a ship disappearing and reappearing in a slightly shifting misty curtain of spraying polyethylene glycol and that was it um as time went on some of more of the ship's artifacts were preserved and they were displayed and then of course more recently they managed to finish the preservation program and now build an entire new museum around her which includes a ton of the various displays and then you've also got that upper section which as i say that's where you can actually go and well you can see the ship from multiple levels of the museum but the upper walkway you actually get into that air locked compartment that she's actually in and you can see her without anything between you and the ship other than distance and that brings us to the end of this week's episode of the dry dock thank you very much for listening and i hope to see you again in another video soon bye